there are some out there who will call me because I teach you to obey the commandments of God, his statutes and his precepts. Because I teach that, there are some out there who will say that I am a legalist. Well, if you have Jesus as your Savior, you should be reading about Jesus. You should be studying what he taught. And you can only do that by reading the four Gospels. And if you have a red letter New Testament, that should be easy to find the words of Christ and to read them, to study them, to see what he taught. Turn to Matthew 4, verse 4. Jesus said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, is Jesus a legalist? Because he tells you, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, he tells you that you better, you should be living by every word of God. You should be studying the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and letting it teach you how to live. Matthew chapter 24. The disciples asked Jesus what would be the signs of his coming that they would know when his coming was imminent. You can read about that in Matthew 24, verse 3. And he goes on to give those signs. And one of those signs was indeed a time of trouble coming on this earth like the world has never seen before. And in Luke chapter 21, the same account as Matthew 24, Jesus talked about Jerusalem being surrounded by armies and people then knowing that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed would have to flee. And he brings this out in Matthew 24. He says, but pray that your flight be not in the winter. I think we can all understand about trying to flee in the winter time and certainly depending where you live in the world. But pray that your flight be not in the winter neither on the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day. This is a prophecy in Matthew 24 for the time of the end. And Jesus is still talking about the Sabbath day and that you should be praying that you do not have to flee on the Sabbath day. Why? Because the Sabbath day is not your day. It is a day to worship God upon. It is not a day to do your own thing. And even to the point of saving your own life, you are to be worshipping God on that day. And Jesus plainly here showed that the Sabbath day would still be in existence just before he returned in a time when you had to flee away out of the danger that was around you. The Sabbath day that Jesus knew about in the Gospels is very clear. It is very clear. There is the, the only Sabbath day that was in existence at the time of Jesus Christ. The only weekly Sabbath day in existence was the fourth commandment. And it was to do with the seventh day. And it was to do indeed with Jesus keeping the Sabbath in the Gospels. He never argued with the Pharisees about which day was the Sabbath. He just argued with them and debated with them about how you keep the Sabbath. But Jesus is plainly showing here, at the time of the end, when it's time to flee out of the end time persecution and trouble, that you are to pray that it will not be on the Sabbath. The Sabbath day is still in existence. It has never been done away with. It has never been changed. It is the fourth commandment, as the fourth commandment reads in the Bible. How can you take out a commandment of the Ten Commandments that has more words in it than any other commandment? How can you just rip that out of the Ten Commandments and say there's only nine that we have to obey today? That is absolute theology from planet Pluto. Jesus taught about keeping the Sabbath he showed how it should be kept. And he says in Matthew 24, it will be at the end. And people need to pray that their flight 
out of danger, be not on the Sabbath day. Is Jesus legalistic? Well, let's see a little more here. Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the, of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous... What is righteousness, friends? Do you know? Do you know what the Bible definition of righteousness is? Psalm 119, verse 172, mark it in yellow. Always remember it, the Bible definition of righteousness. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and fed you and thirsty and gave you to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and took you in or naked and clothed you? Or when did we see you in prison and came unto you? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Truly I say unto you, inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. Then shall he say also to them on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, even into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you did not feed me. I was thirsty, and you did not give me drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't take me in. I was naked, and you didn't clothe me. I was in prison, and you didn't visit me. Then shall they also answer and say unto him, Lord, when saw we hungry, or thirsty, or stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not do it unto you? Then shall he answer them, saying, Truly I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Now notice verse 46. And these, the ones that didn't do it, these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Did Jesus teach salvation by works? No, he did not. He did not teach salvation by works. And what he inspired in the rest of the New Testament clearly proves that, that you do not gain salvation by working at it, adding up X number of points above all the bad points and somehow working your way into salvation. He never taught such a thing. And Salvation is indeed, you are saved by grace, not of works. You're saved by grace because, look, it's very simple. You could keep the Ten Commandments of God perfect for a month, but if you commit one sin, you are guilty of sin. You, are, you come under the death penalty. And it's only the grace of God through Jesus Christ that can cleanse you from that sin. It's, it's, it's like you're driving and you obey the speed limit for a month, maybe a year, maybe two or three years, and then you break it one day, and the policeman stops you, and he gives you a ticket. Does he say to you, how many times did you keep it in the past, so as I could maybe, uh, you know, wipe this ticket away? Does he even ask you such a question? No, of course not. You have broken the speed limit, and he gives you a penalty. And he doesn't ask how many times you've kept it good because that can wipe away the time that you didn't keep it correctly? Of course not. And it's the same with salvation. Jesus did not teach salvation by works, but he did teach what he taught here. Have you just read it? Have you listened to it? Have you listened to the words of Christ that I just quoted to you? Jesus taught 
that if you did not have the nature of God, and God is love, God is merciful, God is kind, God is patient, God is giving, he is a serving God. Jesus said that he lets the rain and the sun shine on the evil and the, and the good. He is a concerned God. He's a helpful God. That's part of his character. And unless you as a Christian have his character dwelling in you through the Holy Spirit of power, through God's nature in you, unless you have that in you, and, and, and unless you are manifesting that by the way that you live, and this is what Jesus is saying here, it is a lifestyle. Being a Christian is a lifestyle. It's a way you live. It's not just in your mind and in your heart. It's how you live in actions. It is a lifestyle. And unless you have this particular lifestyle in you, you just ain't going to be in God's kingdom. That's what Jesus plainly taught here. Not salvation by works, but a true Christian, a true child of God is filled with his nature. And his nature is serving people. It is helping people. It is doing good when you can. And I know we're all in different situations. Some of us have more physical goods than others. Some of us have more money than others. It's whatever God has given us to use in this lifetime that we can still serve our fellow man. And that we are to. We are to serve our fellow man in whatever way that we can. It's a part of God's character. And if you don't have that character in you, as plainly as Jesus said here, these shall go away into everlasting punishment. But the righteous, the ones who are doing the righteousness of God, into eternal life. And part of the righteousness of God is serving others, is helping others, giving to others, doing whatever you can with whatever you have been given to serve others. And that is not legalistic. If you think it is, if you think doing those things is legalistic, then you have said you are making out Christ to be legalistic. I know how you're trying to use this word legalistic, many of you ministers. I know how you're trying to use it. Using it in a wrong way to try to poo-hoo those people who will teach what the words of Jesus Christ are so teaching here and in Matthew 4 verse 4. is to have the nature and the character of God that puts into action what the nature of God is. And indeed, plain words here, plain words. And Jesus Christ, indeed, was never, in that sense that you want to use it, legalistic. He was one who came to do the will of the Father, to speak the will of the Father, to tell us the words of the Father. He said, they're not my words. They are the Father's words. And he came to teach us about godliness and what it means to really be a child of God.